Ideas in STEM Ed is a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center at UC San Diego, which works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. My name is Darren Lapomi, Professor of Nanoengineering and Chemical Engineering and Faculty Director of the Idea Center. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a forum for the discussion of innovative and inclusive approaches to teaching and mentoring, and to support the personal and academic flourishing and success of students in science and engineering. To learn more about the Idea Center, visit jacobschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. My guest today is Neil Thompson, author, speaker, engineer, and host of the Teach the Geek podcast. Neil is an advocate of science and engineering education. He's a children's author and an educator in the area of improving the speaking skills of technical professionals. In particular, Neil founded the Teach the Geek to Speak platform, which contains many helpful materials and resources to help you as a technical professional, um, including scientists and engineers, make your ideas come to life to technical and non-technical audiences alike. I got to know Neil a few months ago when I was a guest on his Teach the Geek podcast, and I almost feel that I have to give him a producer credit for ideas in STEM ed because he's actually connected me with, uh, with many uh, of the recent podcast guests. So it is my honor to speak with him today. Neil, welcome to Ideas in STEM ed. Thanks for having me. What's the definition of a geek and why is it important that they learn to speak? Well, a definition of a geek is somebody who knows a lot about a, a certain subject, more so than perhaps the general population. And why it's important for them to be able to speak is oftentimes those people working at companies, they're the ones that are, they have their heads down doing their work and they think that that's going to be enough for them to get noticed and perhaps get the promotions and pay raises that they think they deserve. But if you've been in corporate for any length of time, you'll realize that that's not the case the majority of the time. Typically, the people who get ahead are the ones who are good at advocating for themselves and those who are connected with the people who have the ability to move them up within corporations. And if you're just sitting at your desk thinking that you're going to get noticed, then you're sorely mistaken. So improving your ability to speak and just becoming more comfortable getting in front of the people that can affect your career, well, that's going to be to benefit to you. So our audience is uh, composed of mostly students who might be wondering, in an, in an engineering organization, who do I have to communicate with it, it, apart from my coworkers? Well, your boss, certainly. And then perhaps your boss's boss should know about you, too. When, when I, I remember when I started working, it, I was working as a research associate, and I didn't see the benefit of getting better at giving presentations in front of other people. I worked in a lab mostly doing experiments and I just give the results to my boss and he'd be the one that would present to other people. And I didn't mind that arrangement at all. It wasn't until that second job where I had to give presentations in front of management on a monthly basis that I see the benefit of getting better at just being, com being more comfortable talking in front of these people, CEO, CTO, CMO, C fill in the blank O, all the, all the Cs, you know, just having these people know who you are and know that you actually convey this information really well, well, that actually puts you on their radar list. And perhaps then you do get those promotions that you think you deserve. One of the things I admire about you is your ability to encapsulate ideas in a concise manner. How do you get better at doing that? Hmm. You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a great compliment. Thank you very much. Uh, well, at practice, I mean, I'm, I've always been rather economical with my words, shall I say. I, I like being able to convey things quickly because the more words you use, the more opportunity you give people to tune you out. So I figure if you're able to communicate with fewer words as possible, that's always best. And I, I just, I would say that to get better at it, it would just be with, with practice. Do you have a script when you present in front of, say, your boss or your boss's boss? Absolutely not. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it a script because when I think of a script, I'm thinking of acting. When I think of acting, they got lines to read. I don't practice to, to memorize every word that I'm going to say. I would say that I have a, an outline when I give a presentation with, with the, the culmination of that outline being the call to action. When I used to have to give presentations in front of management, at least those first few ones, I had no call to action at all. So they had no clue likely what they needed to do or what I would hope that they'd do after the presentation was over. But I eventually got the, the, the sense that this is something that I needed to work on. They need to know, and it has to be very clear, 
what they are expected or what I need them to do after the presentation. So focusing on what that call to action is, is really important. And then working backwards, what points do I need to make that will funnel into that call to action? What intro do I have to have, which will funnel into that, into those points, which will funnel into that call to action. So I'm a big fan of starting with the end in mind and, and working backwards. How does your approach change if you're speaking to a small group as opposed to a large group? Hmm. I'm not sure. It, I'm not sure it changes all that much. Maybe I, I speak a little louder for a larger group to make sure everyone hears. <laughs> but other than that, I just think no matter the, the size of the group, your goal is to impart a message to these people in, in as effective a way as possible. So really sticking to whatever that call to action is, you know, regardless of group size and working backwards, I think is a, a good way to go. What are some of the tools that you've used in order to improve your ability to communicate? Toastmasters was a big one. So when I when I finished, well, when I left the job, well, what ended up happening is my project got canceled from that second job that I had. And I was worried that I'd be out of a job since I was actually brought into that company to work on that specific project. Turns out I was just put on other projects. But what I ended up doing to try to get better at giving presentations was join Toastmasters. And for those that don't know, it's an international organization with clubs all over the world. And its goal is to really help people become more comfortable just talking in front of people. And that's been, that was a game changer, really. It's a great forum to practice your public speaking skills. And then after that, I just, I wasn't as hesitant to give presentations in front of people because I wanted that practice. So even outside of, of what I was doing at Toastmasters, I would look for opportunities within whatever company I was working at to give presentations because you don't get better until you, unless you practice, practice makes progress. So in Toastmasters, what are the prompts like? Like what, uh, can you talk about anything or do they give you a topic? Oh yeah, there, there certainly are prompts, at least back when I was in it. I mean, I haven't been a member for a few years now, but when I was a member, there certainly are topics that they give you. There's actual books, there's several books that they, that they, that they give to the members and you give a speech based on whatever the topic in that book is. So that was one of the, perhaps the, the downsides of being in Toastmasters. I really wanted to get better at giving the technical presentations that I had to give at the company, but oftentimes that wasn't the topic of the, of the, of the speech that I had to give at Toastmasters, but at least I got better at being more comfortable speaking in front of people. Do you get nervous when you speak in front of people, uh, a group? Every time. And I don't think it's a, I don't think it's good if you don't. It's just it's be, being nervous before giving a presentation is just a sign that you actually care about what you're going to say and you care about the outcome. You care that the call to action is understood by the audience. I'm a firm believer that if you're able to get in front of people with no nerves at all, whether you call it nerves, excitement, anxiousness, whatever you call it, if you don't feel anything before you get up in front of an audience, it's probably because you don't care about the outcome. Do you have any pregame rituals, songs that you listen to, other speakers that you might uh, look at? Oh, well, before I, I give a presentation, I like to visualize. So I'll close my eyes and I take a deep breath and then I'll picture how I would hope things would go. So I'm thinking about the people are looking at me and I'm looking at them. I'm hitting all the points that I want in my in my presentation. I make sure to hit that call to action so that the people in the audience know what needs to be done afterwards. Even in the call in the question and answer period, I'll answer the questions confidently and be be comfortable admitting when I don't know the answer to a question and then looking up the answer later to make sure that the presentation, if I have to give it again or a similar presentation, is better the next time around. And then I'll open my eyes and I'm a lot more, I'm in a better frame of mind and a better state to give the presentation when I actually have to do it. Does podcasting make you nervous? Not as much, mainly because I'm not in front of people. I can make sure that my environment is a comfortable environment. And maybe when I'm a guest, maybe it's a little different than when I'm the actual host. Because when I'm the host, I, I'm the one preparing the questions, and it's mostly the guest that's doing most of the talking. But when I'm the, the guest myself, there may be a bit of, of, of anxiousness there, because especially if you don't know the questions beforehand, although that's the what I prefer. You know, I have a podcast, you mentioned I have a podcast and a YouTube channel myself. And whenever the guest asks for the questions beforehand, and I've actually given them the questions, it's never been that interesting an interview because what you're getting is just rehearsed answers. What I'm, I'm a bigger fan of just conversations. And in the event that you ask a question that I may not know the answer to, well, I'll, I'll just think about it for a while. And if there's a, if there's a pause because of it, so be it, but at least you get an answer.
<laughs> that's that's right. You know, it's it's funny. Uh, I I actually get more nervous as the interviewer than as the guest. Um, I feel like sometimes the being an interviewer makes you maybe think on your feet a little bit more than being a guest because you can write out some notes, some things you might want to ask the guest, but the conversation never goes in the direction of of any uh, you know written out list. So, um, you know, I find myself having to think on my feet. Do you, do you find that at all? Not particularly. And if, if up until this point, I've made you think on your feet, I apologize. <laughs> I, I hope I've been answering the questions <laughs> to your satisfaction. I'm not going oh, yeah. No, it has nothing, it has nothing to do with, uh, with, to my satisfaction. It's, uh, you know, you never, you never know what the last, uh, what the last, um, with the, the, the last or heaviest or most important idea is going to be in a response. And that always seems like for a coherent, you know, conversation that you're going to present that you ought to follow at least on kind of that theme. And sometimes it's like, oh, do I have, do I have a question, uh, <laughs> that would, that would complement or, uh, or, or reinforce or develop a particular idea. How do you prepare for a podcast interview? Uh, when you're when you're the interviewer, I typically look at people's LinkedIn profiles, and if there's something that stands out from it, then that's something I, I mention or I, I tend to ask questions about. But with my podcast, I interview mostly technical people, people with technical backgrounds about their public speaking journeys. So a lot of the questions I ask are pretty standardized at this point. Firstly, I want to know more about their background and and why they studied what they studied. And that that question really came from my own reasons for what, as to why I studied what I studied. I, I I actually became an engineer because my father told me to. I didn't become one because it was something that I was looking to do. I, I didn't really know about engineering at all, really. But he said, do engineering. And I had no other idea. So I said, all right. <laughs> I'm the, I'm, so now I asked the question to see if anyone else <laughs> went into engineering for the same reason. And it turns out, not really. They actually had a pretty good reason. <laughs> as to why they did it because they actually it was something they wanted to do when they were a kid they maybe they played yeah. with legos and they took things apart you know appliances apart when they were kids and maybe they, they were in a box club i would have been i would have been in big trouble if i tried to take the toaster apart when i was a kid <laughs> <laughs> so you'll you'll enjoy this so um my daughter's too young to listen to podcasts she's three and a half and she has this uh, pomodoro um you know, tomato shaped uh, kitchen timer that I actually bought as a uh, to do the Pomodoro technique to focus, help me focus at work. And of course, it was bright and shiny and it became her toy. Now, we couldn't get the thing to turn off. No matter what position you twisted it in, it would still tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And it was so annoying that I took it down. I took it, you know, away. I said, I'm going to I'm going to fix it. And so I unscrewed it and the spring on the inside just popped off and all the little gears went everywhere <laughs> and there's no no electronics no nothing in it but i'm like um it is going to cost me way too much time to figure out how to put this thing <laughs> back together so i just glued the plastic halves back together and say it needs a new and said it needs a new battery <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that excuse might not work in a few years I know that's uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it while I can. <laughs> so what kind of engineer are you? I got a degree in materials engineering. So that was my undergraduate degree. And then my father said, do a master's. So I did a master's in bioengineering. And then my father said, do a PhD. And then I started a PhD in biomedical engineering, but I never finished it. I dropped out after the first year. You know, when you're 18 years old and you know just out of high school, perhaps you're a little more amenable to what your parents say. And then when I started the the master's program, I was 22, and I guess I was still a little amenable to what my father had to say. But by the time I dropped out of that program, I was 25, and I just I decided that it was time to start living for what I wanted to do, as opposed to what someone else, my parents included, my father included, wanted me to do. And that was a, that was a tough decision. I mean, my, <laughs> to this day, I mean, that was over 15 years ago. My father probably still not all happy that I dropped out of that PhD program. But I'm, I'm sure he'll get over it at some point. What, what sort of engineering firms have you worked at? You don't have to give names, but just what, what kinds of uh, fields were they in? Oh, medical devices all the way. So I started off at a startup in the Boston area, and we were working on collagen implants for, for, for articular cartilage. And then that company actually was acquired, although they were acquired after I'd left. I left, and then they actually laid off people. So I actually avoided that. 
And then a few years later, they were acquired. So they don't even exist anymore. I, I left that company to come out to California where I, where I currently am and still am. And I was working at a, a spinal implant company for a few years. I was working in the orthobiologics group. It was a newly formed group. And for those of you all that don't know, spinal implants can be made out of human cadaver bone. And I was part of that group that was making those or designing those implants out of human cadaver bone. The boss that I had at that company started his own company and I went with him to this new company. And I was there for about four years and we're doing very similar, similar work, orthobiologics. And then I left there and took a contract job at a, another company. And they were also working on orthobiologics. That's, they was, that's what they brought me in for. And I was supposed to be there for a year, five months into the contract, the CEO asked me to come to his office. And I thought he was asking me to come to, to tell me what a great job I was doing. Turns out he asked me into his office to tell me that my services would no longer be needed and that they wanted to focus more on sales and marketing. They didn't really want to develop anything anymore because they were trying to be acquired, which they eventually were. So now, you know, five months into this contract, I have to figure out what, I, what I'm going to do next. Am I going to start my own thing? Am I going to get another job? I just never wanted to be in that position ever again where someone was calling me into their office telling me my services were no longer needed. So yeah. finding another job was not an option at that point. And it still isn't to this day. So I, I don't work for anyone. And I, I do the things that I want to do, the things that, I, that interest me. And I see where they lead me. Great. So so if you had to draw a pie chart of the things that you do, um, you know, over the course of a month or a year, uh, what, what kind of... Uh, uh, items make that up. Sure. So there's Teach the Geek, obviously. That's you, there's that. So that's helping technical professionals with their their presentation skills, and that would take up probably about fifty percent of my time. Prospecting, doing the YouTube channel, doing the podcast, you know, just doing the work that the, to, to generate more business with that and the the book. And I, I have a book about it as well. And then there's the children's book. Ask Uncle Neil why is my hair curly. That would take up about. I would say I said it's 50. So that's another. So let's say what's half of 50? 25%. <laughs> 25%. And that's me going around and, and doing author visits and and promoting that book as well. That's been that's been a lot of fun. The book's about my nephew asking me why his hair is the way it is. And I use science to answer the question. And the goal for me writing the book was to encourage more children to consider careers in STEM and also to foster their curiosity because. The question askers of today are the problem solvers of tomorrow. And then the rest of it, I would say, is, is split up into, so I guess, 12 and a half percent each. So, so the first 12 and a half percent would be with a, a, a company or a consulting, a consultancy that I started with a couple of former coworkers where we help typically smaller medical device companies with their packaging. Because oftentimes they'll be focused on developing the product, but there's quite a bit of work that needs to go into developing the packaging that the product goes into as well. And then the remaining 12.5% has to do with patent drafting. 10 years ago, I became a patent agent and I became one because the boss that I had, the same one that I followed to the company, he asked that I become a patent agent so that he wouldn't have to outsource patent drafting to outside counsel. I don't know if you notice a, a theme here, but my father told me to go into engineering. My boss told me to become a patent agent. Apparently I'm a pretty obedient person. <laughs> so I became a patent agent. And would you know that he still outsourced all the patent drafts from the outside council. So for a, for a while there, <laughs> I had I was a patent agent with nothing to patent. But now I do some contract work with a firm here in San Diego, drafting mostly medical device related patents. So that's that's about what I do. Would you recommend the intellectual property route to um, engineering students? Oh sure. I I don't know I don't know if I necessarily recommend the going to law school route. So the difference between a patent agent and a patent attorney is law school. The patent agent and attorney can both draft patent applications. They can both prosecute them at the patent office. The only difference is patent agents can't do anything outside of drafting and prosecuting patents. So a patent attorney could do licensing deals. They could do business formation. They could do other things that are trademarks, copyrights. They could do other things that attorneys can do. So what did you learn about hair chemistry writing your book? Oh, that was that was interesting. So I had a pretty inquisitive nephew and I didn't actually know the answers to the question either. So I had to do a bit of research, a lot of Google searching. And it turns out that the there is no clear cut answer. So when I learned that, I thought, well, the book idea is over. What am I going to say? You know, I asked this question, I need to provide an answer. But it turns out it actually worked out really well. And it 
it worked out because of uh, an acquaintance that I had at the time. And I was telling her, uh, I, there's no answer to this. So I guess I can't write the book. And she said, oh, no, you have to write the book now because you can tell the kids about scientific consensus. I said, do the kids 78 years old want to know about scientific consensus? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you, maybe That's you don't funny. use those words, but you basically <laughs> say that there's no agreement as to why the 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 the, the, the hair is the way it is. But perhaps you, the, the reader, you know, the little kid, you could be the one to figure it out and get that scientific consensus. So start with the you know getting that scientific consensus. And when she put it that way, I thought, oh, that works really well. So I'm still gonna write this book. I love the racial equity aspect of of writing that particular book too. Is that um, uh, something that's close to your heart? Is uh, increasing diversity, um, black participation in in STEM? Well, when it comes to black participation in STEM, I want people to go into STEM who want to go into STEM. You know, just coming, just starting from my own background, why I went into it, I just don't think it was the best reason. You go into something because you're interested in it and you're willing to put in the work to get good at it and to work in it. And if you have those two things, then by all means, go into it. But if there's something else that you prefer to do, well, that's a valid choice too. So I'm not the fan of people saying, though, this group and that group need to go into STEM. I'm a fan of telling people that it's an option for you. It's there for you to take if you want. But if there's something else you prefer to do, well, you can do that too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... How do you select your podcast guests? I just look, I look at their LinkedIn profiles oftentimes. And if it's something that, that piques my interest, then I'll reach out to them. And also, since I've done so many episodes now, some of the guests refer people to me as well. So then when that happens, then I'll look into their background and see if there's something that, that piques my interest too. Although I will say that a lot of times when people refer guests to me, I, I do end up interviewing them. And it actually works out really well because I figure... Well, if you're affiliated with this person and I found that inter that interview to be interesting, well, then this interview will likely be interesting, too. And by and large, that's been the case. It's such a rigorous schedule you have. You record once a week. Is that right? Oh, no, no. I, I record whenever people are available to record. So I, I prefer to, to, to record at around 8 a.m. my time, you know, on the West Coast. But if people aren't available then and are available at other times, then I'm, I'm very accommodatable. Is that a word? I can accommodate people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, accommodatable. I like it. It's a cromulent word to use the Simpsons <laughs> reference. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, because I, I, you know, I enjoy that uh, that your podcast, you know, lights up my uh, my Spotify, my Apple podcast feed, and I'm like, yeah, Neil's Neil's uh, Neil's got somebody new this week. That's great. Oh, okay, you know what? I misunderstood your question. I thought you were asking me on when I record these interviews, but yes, I do post. Uh, interview out once a week on Wednesdays. Okay, wonderful. Um, what are some of the characteristics of a good scientific speaker or technical speaker? I don't mean like, you know, innate characteristics, but when you're watching them speak, what are some of the things that they do? I think they are empathetic to the, the people that they're speaking to. They understand that the people they're speaking to likely don't have the same level of expertise that they do. And so they tailor their presentations to match whatever that expertise is. The ones that don't do that are the, the poor speakers. They think, I'm going to use all the technical jargon that I'm accustomed to. I'm going to go into the weeds of, of what I'm accustomed to. And the people in the audience that just have their eyes glazed over, or they're looking at their phones, or they're falling asleep. And oftentimes, these, the, the, prison, the presenter may not even notice, because another thing that they'll do is have a whole lot of, of text on the slide. So they're reading the slide. So they're not actually looking to see that the people are falling asleep or staring off into space. So that's another instance of, of what makes a speaker not all that great. Yeah, or looking at their <laughs> shoes, right? <laughs> right. You know, when I worked as an engineer, I used to attend a lot of conferences. And a lot of these conferences were academic, more academic in nature. So a lot of the presenters were postdocs, grad students, and professors. And man, I mean, if you were tired going to those presentations, I suggest not going, or you you go with a cup of coffee or something, some Red Bull, energy drink, something, or else you're, you're likely going to fall asleep because they would end up talking, just reading their slides, not looking at you, using a lot of terms that perhaps they don't, you, the rest of you all don't understand, have a whole bunch of graphs and tables on, a, on a, a slide where it's real difficult to really understand which one they're talking about at any given time. And... When, it, when I look back on it now, I can kind of see why perhaps 
giving a, an effective presentation wasn't the goal because, I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong since you are in academia, but academics are judged by the fact that they talk, they gave a presentation at the conference, not whether they actually did a good job of it. Am I, am I, am I right in saying that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, of, of course, we would rather see uh, people give a good talk, but there are plenty of famous scientists who are not good speakers, and the, the room will be packed all the way to the back, standing room only, uh, and yet they, they made all of the mistakes that you just said. You know, they have way too much on the slides. You know, one of the things that most famous PIs do is they will do like one paper per slide and they'll they'll like, you know, they publish whatever 40 papers a year and they just go through this presentation that we call it like a PI talk, right? Where it's uh, just look how great I am. Look how many covers I have. Look how many, you know, nature materials papers I have. Um, and then you, you get to the end and like you learn what they've done, but you don't really learn anything <laughs> you don't really learn anything <laughs> new like there was no there was no mystery solved there was no you know new insight into physical systems it was just like that da -da -da -da, and i did this and i did this and we did this and we did this and my students did this and this and this so yeah it's uh those those are another kind of category of talks that i i'm, I'm not a big fan of from from academics <laughs> Yeah, and if you're a junior person, it's not as if you're gonna go up to this PI and tell them that the presentation sucked. Probably gonna keep it to yourself. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a nepotistic world. It's 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 um you know you never know who's gonna be reading your grant proposal or your paper submission or who's gonna be writing a a letter for your tenure and promotion file, right? Right. Do we need to be doing anything in academia to improve the way that engineers are taught social skills, team working, presentation, soft skills? Well, we actually do it. I mean, I remember how when I was in engineering school, <laughs> I wasn't really something that was, that was promoted at all. I mean, I mentioned my first job, I didn't have to do any kind of presentations and that was great because I wasn't prepared for that at all. It wasn't until I was th kind of thrown into the fire, that second job where I was told I was going to be a project lead and essentially what a project lead was is the, the company was too cheap to hire project managers, so they pushed that responsibility onto the product development engineers. And that's how I ended up having to give those presentations. It was it was something that I, I was kind of forced to do. So at some point, I kind of had to figure out how to how to do it. And man, it would have been a lot easier if I, if I, if I could have gotten at least a little bit of training when I was in school. Can you point to uh, one particular outcome where it was the result of you giving a super killer presentation to your uh, your team or your boss, your boss's boss, where something came out of that and you're like, yes, I did that. And it was because uh, I took I took my um, you know, presentation very seriously. Well, I could give you an, ex an example of when I gave a webinar and this was not even that long ago. This was maybe a year or two ago. So it wasn't when I was working at a company, it was me working for myself. And I gave a webinar for the University of Maryland, Baltimore County Engineering Management Program on presentation skills. And that even came about from a webinar that I did with the American Society for Engineering Management. And the person who, le who led the, the UMBC Engineering Management Program at the time, I suppose liked what I had to say so much that he brought me on as an adjunct instructor. So I actually do that now too. I probably oh, should have awesome. put that in the pie chart. <laughs> <laughs> well, a pie chart can have more than a hundred percent. Yeah, I'm exceptional. I, I knew that, Neil. <laughs> um, is there is there anything that you'd like to share with our students and our audience that I didn't get to ask that uh, maybe was on the tip of mind? Oh well, when it comes to getting better at presenting in front of people, don't be like me. Don't wait until it's their second job and you're kind of forced into it to get better at it. Because ultimately, and I I mean this you know, sincerely, the people that move up in the companies are the ones who are able to communicate with others. They're not the people necessarily who are the most technically proficient. Because ultimately, because oftentimes when you become a manager of people, well, you're not, they're not really relying on your technical skills now anyway. You're, they're relying on you being able to rally people, to remove blocks and, and, and problems for others others, just being able to communicate with others to get them to do their best. So if you develop those skills outside of, of what you are technically, then you give yourself the best opportunity to move up and, you know, try to develop those skills sooner than later. 
I love that, Neil. It also makes me feel personally very justified in the career path that I've taken because I cannot uh, do bench science anymore. I don't know where anything in the lab is. I, I, I would break things if I went in there. But what I can do is write grants and speak and rally my team. So uh, thank you for that advice, uh, Neil. That's great. Um, uh, Neil Thompson, um, author, speaking coach, um, doing wonderful things around science um, and, uh, and, and communication education. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening to Ideas in STEM Ed, a production of the Idea Engineering Student Center in the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. This episode was edited and engineered by Sky Lee with theme music written and performed by John Viviani. Title art was created by Caitlin Wong. Special thanks to Sarah Eckerd for guest booking and marketing. The Idea Center works to promote community, success, and inclusion at all levels. To reach us for guest suggestions and other feedback, please send an email to ideadirector at eng.ucsd.edu. And to learn more about our programs, visit jacobsschool.ucsd.edu front slash idea. As a final note, the views expressed by me or the guests do not necessarily reflect those of the Idea Center, the Jacobs School of Engineering, or UC San Diego. See you next time.